Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, May 13th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, civilizing torture, an American tradition with W. Fitz Brundage. Also on the program today, Trump's trade war with China coming to a head, but it's nothing like real war, says Tom Cotton. Also, 44 states sue generic drug makers on price fixing. And the Supreme Court rules against Apple a massive antitrust suit over the Apple Store to continue. Meanwhile, Joe Biden increases his lead. Beto launches 2.0. And the Senate Democratic prospects seem to be in danger because so many of those potential candidates are running for president. Meanwhile, Pentagon diverting $1.5 billion for Trump's wall. And Chuck Schumer's big 2020 gambit. Outlaw robocalls. And the heartwarming tale of a South Carolinian Republican lawmakers being attacked after retelling of her rape in the course of an abortion debate. Saudi tankers supposedly sabotaged off the UAE coast. Chelsea Manning may be headed back to jail as a new grand jury convenes investigating Julian Assange. All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome back. It is uh, Monday. Uh, everybody's here uh, except for uh, Michael. Michael has the uh, cold that's going around uh, this office. I thought I had um, allergies. And now I'm starting to think that maybe I've had a cold. Yeah. I'm not sure. I think I got your cold over the weekend. Try taking some Claritin. I've taken Claritin and it, and it sort of helped. I think I might have caught the same allergies, unfortunately. There's a lot of that going around. Um, tonight, folks, uh, big uh, Green New Deal rally, AOC, uh, Bernie, others. Um, and I believe it's taking place at Howard University. I'm not 100% sure about that, but um, I imagine it'll be uh, streaming online. Should be exciting. Um, it will be at Howard uh, University. And it is being organized by the Sunrise Movement. Uh, which, of course, is that uh, group that occupied Nancy Pelosi's office at the beginning of this uh, Democratic, or I should say, congressional session. Um, and all of that uh, happening, with this sort of uh, backdrop, as you know, uh, Joe Biden the other day said he's uh, developing a, um, a new climate change plan that is going to be more, more moderate. He's trying to strike a balance between... Um, telling the world not to um, not to get so hot and uh, us doing something about it. He's going to try and he's going to try and meet nature halfway and see if nature will compromise a little bit. It's global lukewarming. Yeah. He's going to basically say, why be so, so hot? Why not be a little bit less hot? 
And he's uh, going to put his hand on Mother Nature's back. There you go. He's going to say, maybe I can... Calm down, honey. Maybe, exactly. Maybe I can help you with some of that tension. <laughs> and then uh, and then he's just going to say, oh, oh, well, forgive me, Father. I've sinned. And uh, But um, here is Biden. Now, um, folks, the reality is uh, his lead is expanding. And um, in um, <clears throat> really across the board, I still contend... I mean, nothing's changed in the past four days, uh, five days that I made this contention uh, last week that um, uh, by September, Democratic voters uh, will have a different sense of Joe Bi- who Joe Biden is. I mean, people just aren't largely paying attention to this race, largely. Um, and the idea of a guy who's already been vice president under an extremely popular president uh, sounds very, very appealing, particularly one who is like a guy you'd apparently want to have a beer with. And um, but I have a feeling and maybe this is ho- hopeful. Uh, this is more aspirational, maybe uh, than it than it should be. But uh, that as folks get a better look and they start to key in when we start to see debates and we start to, uh, you know, maybe even by the fall, uh, by by, I guess, late September, October, that people will have a sort of a more sophisticated understanding of who Joe Biden is. Uh, for instance, you'll recall, because this happened months ago, so people may not remember it, but in 2018, the Democrats had the largest vict- midterm victory that has ever been recorded in terms of, of votes. And the biggest issue that people ran on, and I think it is a, is a mistake to just assume that it was just this issue. Frankly, I think people were, it was a referendum on Donald Trump and there was a lot of uh, disdain for Donald Trump. But the vehicle in which Democrats made this case was through the notion of health care. And about 50 percent of the candidates were running on Medicare for all. Others were um, were running on some variant of expanding um, health care access to people and affordability to people. And I imagine that Joe Biden's going to do the same. But this is a guy who clearly is not terribly keyed into this issue. Listen to his explanation as to why we shouldn't have a Medicare buy-in. I mean, this explanation, as far as I'm concerned, uh, covers a Medicare buy-in. It covers an expansion of Medicare for all. It it basically... um, it's a bizarre reasoning, but apparently he feels this will suffice. Here's Joe Biden um, being asked about health care. What do you say to calls for some sort of universal health care or something like Medicare for all from some of the other people running well, in the Democratic I, look, primary? Well, I, I, I think they're, they're well-intended. I think they mean it, and it's not, I'm not. But here's the deal. Um, right now, you have, 60, you have this overwhelming number of employers who are paying into the health care plan. Why let them off the hook? All of a sudden, they don't have to pay anything? What happens then to this whole thing about profit and the rest? I mean, it is, should be part of the compensation if you have it. What? <laughs> Wait, and, and, I mean, the, this is one of the biggest problems with our health care is that it is tied to the employers. And I, I guess his argument is, you're letting them off the hook, although taxes would go up on employers. They would end up paying more in taxes to pay for Medicare for all, if that's what he's really concerned about. I'm also really impressed by Joe Biden's sense of what the argument is with corporations uh, having too much power and uh, too many tax cuts in his reference of profits and that stuff. Yeah, I have no idea what the hell he's talking about there. Well, I mean, I, I, I totally get what he's saying. And it is nonsense. I mean, that's the worst part about this. This is not a gaffe. This is somebody who thinks that the argument should be the responsibility of employers to provide health insurance as opposed to 
the government. Everyone complains about the notion of being stuck at a job you don't want to be stuck at because it provides you health care. Everyone complains. We used to, the biggest refrain we used to hear when Joe Biden was running for president was that every GM car, 1600 bucks of it was a function of health care that they had to pay. This is just absurd. It's, it is bizarre. And to the extent that Joe Biden, you know, has basically shielded himself, I think, from a lot of, uh, a, a lot of direct sort of interviews and reporting and questioning about his policies. This is, should be one. I mean, that is just a remarkable thing to say, considering the fact that many of his votes come from the fact that he's so experienced. I mean, this is a guy who clearly has not even engaged in the issue. I mean, of all the issues you can come up with about, about Medicare for all, to argue that it somehow lets employers off the hook when we all know they're going to be paying more in taxes, but that that's the problem. As if Medicare for all, the desire for people to have health insurance that is not only affordable, but easy, basically just getting health care, as if that desire is rooted in attacking businesses is basically adopting a conservative right-wing frame and turning it on its head um, in a ludicrous fashion. I mean, it, it, is, it is beyond silly. And, and it's this type of stuff, why I think Joe Biden ultimately is going to falter. And it really is just a function of, of whether his understanding of policies and his desire, you know, his uh, what he his prescriptions for the American public end up becoming more widely understood by the general electorate. So uh, we shall see. But um, well, I, I'm shocked by that stuff. He had to think on his feet, right, and come up with something that sounded kind of populist. And he's scrolling through the options in his head like insurance companies. No, people don't like those credit card companies. No, no, no. Uh, bosses. Yes, the bosses are bad. It lets them off. It's I don't but I don't think he was thinking on his feet. I mean, it's impossible to imagine that they haven't said, like, how are you going to respond to the fact that people are calling? Me? I mean, this would be the f day one, right? It is weird that he just gestures vaguely populist as if it doesn't really matter what's he, what he says. It's just about tone. Yeah. Well, he might true. be right. Yeah, no, he might. Uh, folks, no need to suffer through another sleepless night thanks to Calming Comfort by Sharper Image. The luxurious weighted blanket is made with super soft velveteen material and designed with high-density comfort fill to promote a sense of calmness. Plus, by applying an even amount of pressure over your body, Calming Comfort helps the production of serotonin and melatonin and mimics the soothing feeling of being hugged for a restful night's sleep. I will say this. It is uh, still unseasonally uh, cold in uh, New York City. And I have to uh, say that um, I have a confession to make. I'm happy about it. I like to sleep in the cold. I like a cold weather sleep. I've been keeping the window open and I can still use my calming comfort blanket. So I get the full effect. I get that weighted feel, which makes me fall asleep faster, makes me stay asleep. And um, it really is um, a, a revelation of sorts. Because I'm also the type of person that likes to sleep on a couch. Because I like that feeling of being like a little bit, um, you know, what do you call it, like in a cocoon. And this gives me that as well. Uh, the Calm and Comfort Weighted Blanket comes with a 90-day anxiety-free, stress-free, best night's sleep of your life guarantee from Sharper Image. Now our listeners can go to calmingcomfortblanket.com. That's calmingcomfortblanket.com. Use the promo code MAJOR15 at checkout and receive $15 off the displayed price. Again, that's calmingcomfortblanket.com. Promo code MAJOR15, because you can't put a price on a great night's sleep. CalmingComfortBlanket.com, promo code MAJOR15. And folks, while you're working on your uh, stress, know that stress is a worldwide epidemic. We work longer hours. We're inundated with a constant news cycle, believe me. And we're more um, 
connected than ever before. Stress is a part of life. It can easily affect our overall wealth and well-being. That's why we're partnering with Calm, the number one app to help you reduce your anxiety and stress and help you sleep better. More than 40 million people around the world have downloaded it. If you head to calm.com slash majority, you'll get a 25% off a Calm premium subscription, which includes guided meditations on issues like anxiety, stress, and focus, including a brand new meditation each day, sleep stories. They're bedtime stories for adults. They're designed to help you relax. Head to the magical lavender fields of Southern France with Stephen Fry or explore the moonlit jungles of Africa with Leona Lewis. They also have soothing music and more, all uh, completely developed to help you sleep. Right now, Majority Report listeners get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash majority. That's C-A-L-M dot com slash majority. Get unlimited access to all of Calm's content today at calm.com slash majority. Get calm. Stop stressing. All right. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, professor of history from UNC Chapel Hill, Fitz Brundage on his uh, Pulitzer nominated book, Civilizing Torture, an American Tradition. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Professor of History at UNC Chapel Hill, W. Fitz Brundage, author of the Pulitzer nominated book Civilizing Torture, an American Tradition. Uh, Fitz, welcome to the program. Glad to be here. So, um, this, uh, your book is uh, both a history of of torture as uh, practiced in um, in this country, and uh, I guess even before it was, in fact, a country, and the mechanism in which we have told ourselves that it hasn't happened in many respects. Um, but let's start with the um, with the earliest examples of of, of the use of torture um, uh, in in colonial times, I guess. Um, what, what stands out as one that is uh, archetypal uh, for you? Well, I think uh, for me, what's archetypal is an uh, incident I talk about, an episode that happened actually in, uh, in what we would now call French Canada, uh, because it's an interesting moment when we see a European settler, in this case a Jesuit priest, involved in a dialogue with a Huron Indian about the appropriateness of torture. And the reason I think it's such a rich moment uh, in the history of this subject is because the Jesuit priest was trying to discourage the Huron uh, Indians from torturing an Iroquois Indian who they had captured, as was a practice in uh, Indian warfare. 
And there was uh, the North American Indians had an elaborate kind of code, if you will, a kind of etiquette about how to apply torture and how it was done, when it was done, what was expected to be the behavior of the victim of their torture as part of warfare. Well, the the Huron's response to the Jesuits is, well, you torture, right? And the Jesuit says, oh, yes, we do torture, but we only torture in these circumstances. And you can see in the brief dialogue that we have, it's not even a dialogue, the account that we have, uh, a back and forth between the Indian trying to figure out, okay, why is our torture bad, but your torture is okay? And simultaneously, the Jesuit trying to work out in his mind an argument for why Indian torture is barbaric, whereas European torture is not barbaric. So the reason I bring this up is because it's a moment when we see the Europeans being confronted with a different culture of torture and trying to figure out how they can, that is how Europeans can persuade themselves, let alone Indians, that they are, in fact, a superior, more civilized people. And it's the working out of that, how it is that Europeans or Euro-American settlers, invaders, convince themselves that their culture of torture is somehow not antithetical to civilization that I think is a very interesting moment in the history of the evolution of ideas about torture. And, and, the, um, and the Huron, and you write and, and, or, uh, that indigenous people um, uh, here anyways, um, their torture was a mechanism to essentially, in some ways sort of almost... Um, to reset a a a, uh, a, um, um, a captive so they could live amongst them. Sometimes, although sometimes it was torture to death, and and I guess here's the the simplest way I would describe the difference. Of course, uh, I, I'm talking about the if you will the idealized notion of torture in these societies. Right. We can be sure that there were instances where these events didn't follow the idealized norms at all. But in European society, torture ever since the ancient Romans had been assumed as a means by which you could extract the truth from a human being. You could use it to force them to tell you what they would say, what would be the honest truth, because the mind could not prevent the body from telling truth. So in the European mind, there's a relationship between bodily pain and truth, whereas for North American Indians, torture was a way in which one society of Indians, one Indian nation, could convey its disdain for its enemy, and simultaneously the victim of the torture was supposed to, through his extreme ability to absorb torture, was supposed to reflect back his disdain for his torturers. So there was a a, a very different purpose, if you will, to the acts of torture. Now, you would say from an outsider, what's happening in both instances is a human body is being subjected to horrific forms of bodily torture. And so superficially, torture is happening to both bodies, but for very different purposes. And Europeans often found the Indian, if you will, dialogue between the torturers causing pain and the torture victim trying to mock the torment that he was suffering. They found that to be barbaric, whereas Indians found the idea of what Europeans were doing is to be incomprehensible. And what was it? I mean, I I don't want to jump too far. far ahead, or, or I want to be able to go through a couple of these sort of the, the, the developments in terms of uh, the, 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 the legal strategies and the, um, I guess, the, the rhetorical strategies in which to sort of uh, allow this justification for torture. But, but what was it that ultimately about that European, or was there more of a sense with the the European introduction of torture and what ultimately became sort of uh, the American way of, of rationalizing it. Was there more a sense that there needed to be a rationalization as in terms of like, we need to, um, we, we need to, 
uh, be able to justify this? Uh, are you, you know, a unique justification for our torture um, as opposed to from uh, indigenous people who saw this as part of a, uh, you know, a part of the relationship that they had with their enemies? Yes, I, and I, I think you're you're spot on. That and it it it's the European rationalization of torture was tied to many different concerns. One concern of the Europeans was, of course, that they were working out in their own minds to their own satisfaction the justifications for the kind of expropriation, invasion, decimation of. Uh, American Indian societies. So part of it, you could say, is a rationalization, but it was also, I mean, there was a, a and I'm not trying to, to mitigate at all this by saying that there was simultaneously an effort, so to speak, to elevate this to something more than just simply a crude land grab, which, of course, it was. But the rationalization, of course, was that they were going to Christianize these peoples, if they could be Christianized, and of course they would also be civilized. And that was the, the notion somehow that the Europeans were going to be the bringers, if you will, they were going to disseminate civilization was a hugely powerful idea because it made the colonization, the invasion, something more than just simply a military act. But tied to that at the same time is that not in the case of French Canada, I was talking about before, but for many of the Protestant Europeans who were coming to, to what is now the United States, they also had this powerful association of torture with the Catholic Counter-Reformation, with the Inquisition, all of the stories about the, the dark, dark violence of the Spanish Inquisition throughout Western Europe. And so their association with torture as well was as a kind of tyrannical, despotic act. So there was the torture that they knew in the old world that they associated with the crushing out of true faith and as a kind of backward reactionary form of violence in their minds. And then there was the barbaric torture of Indians on the frontier. And so they were trying to carve out, if you will, a space where torture they were not going to be engaged in the torture of the barbaric Indians as they saw them, nor were they going to replicate the torture they associated with, for example, the Spanish Inquisition. Where does, um, well, let's, let, let, I mean, let's go into, let's move a little further on the timeline, because um, I, I'm curious as to, one of the things I, that I, or the thing that I find fascinating about the book and just about the, the sort of the, the tracking of, of how uh, torture has been rationalized over the past 250 years, at least in in, in this country, um, is it it seems to be a uh, subset of other rationalizations, right? That and I wonder, you know, as we talk about the sort of the the um, the 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 imperial project, I guess, of uh, early um, uh, settlers and in, in taking. Uh, indigenous people's lands, and then slavery. I um, mean, all of this, there's, there seems to be sort of a similar muscle that's being worked in terms of, of justifying it and, and uh, establishing an other and, and, and whatnot. And I, and I wonder, like, wh wh which comes first? The, the sort of the, the sort of the, I guess, the manifest destiny, and therefore, when we do these things, or is it sort of has to be... Um, uh, uh, created in retrospect. That's boy. That's that is the sixty-four million dollar question, and I, I wish I could tell you that I had a, a really cogent answer for that. But I, instead, what I'll do is the what I honestly think. But I, I, I have to work this out with you in conversation, and that is that I think it's not so much one came first as much as they, uh, that is a kind of rationale, rationale for engaging in, for example, torture or extreme forms of violent coercion went hand in hand and evolved con simultaneous with um, an impulse to 
to take advantage of circumstances. And what I mean by that is sometimes the action is driven by people who honestly are not concerned with these high questions of the morality of X or Y or the justice of labeling Indians barbaric or not. So, for example, in the case of um, the so-called Paxton Boys, who were a group of uh, Central Pennsylvania Euro-Americans who massacred Conestoga Indians uh, shortly before the American Revolution, I think that was, uh, I mean, I, I can't get into the minds of those men, but I think their, their uh, rationale was fairly overt, uh, simple, outright racism against the Conestoga Indians and in a desire to remove them from the colony as retribution for other Indian actions elsewhere. What is important about the response to them is then how people who are not, were not present at the massacre, weren't responsible for the massacre, then made sense of it. So I guess that's part of what I would emphasize here, that there are actions on the ground that may be motivated by all of the crass and or complicated motivations that any human may have. But then when the larger society discusses the, their actions and put, comes up with a rationale for it, I think the ways in which that rationale are, are laid out is a very important part of the story. So there's almost like concentric circles of 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 and and the um, the 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 need for rationale maybe it increases as you get a little further away from the actual action itself, from actually perpetrating the action, because it becomes a reflection on your society at large. Yeah, I think that I think that's very well put, and it especially becomes important for those people who are in positions of authority or positions of influence who are trying to articulate whatever the mission of this society is, whether it's in the case of someone like Benjamin Franklin, he's trying to elevate. He, he was a critic, a savage, I mean, or I should use that word, a very stern critic of the Paxton Boys, very eloquent. In his case, he's somehow trying to speak to other Americans, uh, by which I mean other colonial Euro-Americans, as well as back to England and to Europe to reassure people that, yes, we can create a civilization here. We are not going to be savages. Um, and then as you get into the, um, the 1800s, you have, um, uh, I guess, differing contexts for which uh, torture and um, this type of uh, you know, physical and mental punishment is... Um, is is justified in the context of of prisons it's perceived as rehabilitative yes and and i i think one of the important points about that notion of somehow physical co physical coercion can be part of rehabilitation is that it it sets up a a um, a logic which an incredibly powerful logic which persists in, in the imagination, the American imagination to the present day. And that is sometimes we need to physically coerce people to do what's in their best interest, even if that means we have to do things that uh, may appear to some of us as equivalent to torture. And they were perceived to be equivalent to torture in that era, whether it was 24 7 isolation. Uh, which they tried at, in the, at the turn of the 19th century, and they discovered very quickly that it had very severe mental health consequences. But nevertheless, they rationalized that well, that was what was involved, what was necessary, in order to produce the appropriate introspection on the part of prisoners, so that they came to recognize their wrong ways and corrected their behavior. In other instances, there was the idea that, well, nothing will get through the mind of a hardened criminal other than physical violence. And so you have to use violence to compel a prisoner to act the way society wants him to act, because he otherwise won't act that way. So in either case, you can come up with a justification for physical co coercion. And the interesting issue is that those who advocated direct 
violence to the body through flogging and through something that was called the water shower, which is sort of like a 19th century version of watering, waterboarding. Those folks justified that by saying that only physical pain would compel proper behavior. Others who came up with forms of what we might call mental torture that didn't involve physical pain per se, claimed that physical pain was barbaric and that their methods, such as isolation 24-7 from any contact with people, were more humane. So in that case, you can see whichever tactic you chose, you could make the argument it was preferable. How did that um, contrast with the perspective of, 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 of f- physical and, and, and uh, punishment and, uh, I guess, mental to a certain extent of, of slaves? I mean, was there even that level of rationale or was it just simply, um, it's my property, uh, I can do what I want? Well, yes, you're you're certainly right about that. Per, first off, that's the 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 idea that slaves are my property was a you know, not only was it a legal position, a legal tenet, but it was also a, uh, if you will, a kind of practical, uh, widespread belief that uh, slaves were really beyond. The conscience, so to speak, of other humans, we didn't have, that is, we who were not enslaved had no obligation per se to be concerned about the plight of slaves. Now, of course, that began, that idea began to break down in the, in the late um, 18th century as a result of the American Revolution and other influences, but it was still a very powerful idea and a legal principle through uh, until the time of the Civil War. And so I think one of the really enormous challenges for opponents of slavery, abolitionists, was to somehow convince Americans that, in fact, it was possible to torture a slave. And it it seems self-evident, perhaps, to us today that that would be the case. The enslaved were human beings. But if you start from the premise that, in fact, the enslaved are a baser form of humanity— whether you believe that on the basis of racist racism or you believe that on the basis of some idea that somehow Africans are a more primitive form of hum- human beings, all of the rationales that white Americans came up with, you could then justify the idea that, well, somehow the enslaved don't feel pain the way we do, or the enslaved are uh, so primitive that we have to use these methods, or they are enslaved, so they have no rights that we are obligated to recognize, which is pretty close to what the Supreme Court ruled in the Dred Scott decision in 1858. So uh, for the challenge for uh, especially African-American abolitionists, I think, was to establish at a very fundamental level that they were human beings who suffered pain and had a conscience that could be tormented the same way white Americans suffered pain. And, I mean, my sense is is that the following the war and the story of of Andersonville, because what's interesting about this story to me is it seems that prior to this time, at least in terms of broad-based American psyche, right, that... um, People who are tortured are either not people, as you've talked about with the slaves, or are a special class of people Mm -hmm. uh, who have, you know, broken the law and are outside of like sort of normal societal bounds uh, or something like this. But in the context of Andersonville, it seems like that that desire to, um, I guess, you know, uh, not have to confront what lives within our society is somehow uh, really uh, that muscle started to really flex. Yes, I think you're, you're, you're right. And that, I think one of the extraordinary acts of, I'll call it erasure of historical erasure or amnesia is about American civil war prison camps. And you know, we could, argue endlessly, as many people have, those who are interested in this topic, and there haven't been that many, actually, 
we could argue endlessly about whether Confederate prisoner of war camps were worse than Union prisoner of war camps or whether Union officers or Union administrators wanted to treat Confederate prisoners cruelly or vice versa. We can argue that all we want, but what we what we lose sight of or have lost the sort of collective memory of is that there was enormous suffering during the American Civil War and prisoner of war camps and both white northerners and black northerners and I should say white northerners, black northerners and white southerners believed that there was rampant intentional cruelty in these camps. And if there wasn't, well, there was intentional cruelty on some occasions, but even apologists would acknowledge that there was horrific conditions in these camps. And the curious thing is we don't recognize that this was a moment in time when the, if you will, the kind of veil was pulled back and Ameri- white Americans in particular could have seen that we, that is, we white Americans are capable of doing extraordinarily or allowing extraordinary hardship and cruelty well, to other whites. And, and that's, that was a moment in time that Americans could have, in essence, looked at themselves in the mirror. I mean, there, there were other times when, when they could have as well, but they could not have escaped that it was white Americans who allowed this to happen or did this to other white Americans. The, I mean, what, what's interesting, too, about Andersonville, like on one hand, um, one would think like, OK, well, the reason why we don't hear stories of how um, Confederate uh, soldiers were, were essentially subjected to what, a, what, what amounted was tantamount to, to torture is because the Union Army won and they get to write right. the history. Uh, but but Andersonville is is the is 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 the opposite where Union uh, soldiers were were um uh, were 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 treated to what amounted to to torture and on one hand i can understand like okay i can see the um uh you know the president lincoln or uh, union uh, army official saying we're not going to make a big deal of this because we need to heal the country uh right. at this point but it also is it is remarkable there is a, there is at the very least even if that's the reason why it's being done it um, this I, I feel like on some level we're haunted by this notion of turn the page. Right. Because yes, it's yes. literally, you know, 150 years later. That's what um, uh, President Obama is saying about our, our torture program in Iraq. Yes. Yes. And the people who are responsible for turning the page are sometimes exactly as you said, the people you would expect to be responsible I mean, in, in, uh, um, again, not to mitigate what turning the page meant, but one can understand that after a, a civil war of the magnitude and of the bloodshed of the American Civil War, and you're trying to figure out, okay, how are we going to stitch this nation together? You have to make some decisions on the fly of what you're going to talk about, what you're going to focus attention on. And one can understand why some people would decide that, well, in the interest of national reconciliation, there are certain things we're just not going to dwell on, like, for example, the treatment of Union prisoners by Southern, by Confederates. But there are others who participated, and I, I won't get in the weeds long here, but just to say that, for example, one wouldn't have, you probably didn't immediately think to yourself that, well, professional historians played a role in this amnesia about prison camps. But they did. In the early 20th century into the mid 20th century, professional historians played a large role in discounting any evidence of the full horror of the prison camps and offering excuses for them. And that was driven by impulses partially internal to the uh, historical profession, but it was also driven by that broader interest of white northern historians and white southern historians finding some sort of common ground where they could agree on terms about the Civil War. And in the process, they decided, if you will, much like the national leaders, that, well, let's just, let's just not make a big issue out of the Civil War prison camps. 
And then we have this um, phenomena from, and, and it stretches probably earlier than the Civil War, but I would imagine the intensity of, of people coming out of that war, it makes it much easier for people in uh, law enforcement to justify torture of prisoners. Um, as, you, uh, as you talk about uh, from, I guess, you know, from the, the late 1800s into the um, almost up to the World War II, um, this seems to be fairly rampant uh, amongst yes. um, uh, 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 police departments. Uh, tell us about that and how it ends, or that era ends. Yeah, the, uh, I think the uh, <laughs> there are many aspects of American history that they sort of develop organically, and after the fact, it's hard to imagine what it was like before them. And one of them is is police, of course. The United States had local communities in the United States had very fragmentary, if that would be the proper word, uh, police forces of any kind really before the 1840s. And then a few American cities started to mimic the British, particularly London, practice of having actually professional police forces. But they're really quite small on the whole and uh, rather ad hoc until after the Civil War. But as you mentioned, I think the influence of the Civil War, the kind of organizing principle of the war and the military experience, meant that police forces after the Civil War became much more professional. They adopted many attributes of the military in terms of ranks, of officers, uniforms, codes of conduct, etc. And they also assumed a very particular role, which was they weren't just to maintain order, which is what constables had done in the past, uh, but they were also supposed to gather evidence to help the state prosecute wrongdoers. Which if you think about it, those we sort of take it for granted that's what police do, but that's not what police have to do. Uh, you could have the two different functions separated, as, for example, they do in many other countries of the world. So the police aren't developing evidence so much as they are maintaining the order. There are others who do the evidentiary work. Well, what this gets to is, as you could imagine, if police are simultaneously maintaining order and supposed to also generate evidence, this is an era when in the United States there was virtually no forensic science like we see on CSI, and re really until the 1920s and 1930s. So that meant if you were a policeman, how did you find out what happened? Well, you talked to witnesses. If you didn't have witnesses, there was a temptation then to look for the usual suspects and then figure out if there were ways in which you could muscle the information out of them. So by the 1880s, newspapers began reporting very widely uh, about various techniques that police had used. One was sweating where you put a suspect in a very hot room until he breaks down and will confess. Then there was the so-called third degree, which might involve all manner of physical coercion. Um, and then there were other more elaborate things, which were putting, taking someone and putting them in the presence of the murder victim they allegedly had murdered, make them hold the murder weapon, and various other forms of what we would now call psychological duress. And these, by the 1890s, 1900s, had become so commonplace, they were referred to under that umbrella label of the third degree. And newspapers would publish forthright stories about such and such suspect as being given the third degree. Um, and this was the commonplace practice up until really the 1930s, uh, when as a result of a series of Supreme Court decisions, the Supreme Court began to limit the ability of police and district attorneys, prosecuting attorneys, to use coerced confessions. Was, was that so it was a long process? Was that a just a, a development of legal thought, or was there was there was there a a popular pushback on this? Oh, there was definitely a popular pushback, and I think the key to the popular pushback. Well, there were several things that come together, but I think one of the crucial things was prohibition, because prohibition meant that there was a dramatic expansion in police activity 
trying to you know ferret out every, whoever was involved in consuming and or trading in illegal alcohol during prohibition in the 20s but simultaneously there was a kind of in, just pervasiveness of police surveillance and that meant that a lot of people had contact with the police in the 1920s for doing something that had just a few years before been legal right. and these were people who previously would not have been subject to police brutality uh, what I mean by that is you know, white middle-class men and women, uh, all manner of people who had exposure to police me- methods that w- they had been unfamiliar with or had assumed, oh, well, those were methods that were used for people who deserved to be treated that way. So during the 1920s, there was a real sense that the police were out of control. And I would add to that Hollywood contributed in its own way by making all of these movies the so-called gangster movies of the late 20s, early 30s, which depicted the third de- third degree routinely. So there was some of the mystical quality, the mythic quality of the third degree was was punctured, and instead it was seen to be you know, just plain old brutal force. Um, I, I don't want to... Um, I, I'm going to uh, skip over the sort of the extended tradition of 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 police uh torture which you know up until they they found a basically what amounted to a black site in chicago um yep. uh, a couple of years ago where this practice was obviously still continuing and you know we have stories uh from new york um uh back you know uh abner luima and i mean uh, others yep. um but i want to i want to just talk about um uh, uh vietnam to a certain extent sure. because uh, that seems to be, you know, th- this theme of never really addressing these problems and, 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 and folks can apply this dynamic, I think, to a whole host of, of societal ills, particularly in terms of abuse of power uh, by our institutions. But um, in many respects, I, it, 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 it seems to me that um, what happened with uh, torture in Iraq um, and even what is going on today in Guantanamo on some level uh, or, or, or just institutions where we uh, isolate prisoners today. Um, part of that was our failure to really address it in, in Vietnam, uh, even though we address so much, it seems to me, about our, uh, what, what, what our, our involvement in Vietnam. Well, you know, I I guess I would separate out what happened in Vietnam. uh, I would I would draw a distinction. I I think you're right about what happened in Vietnam with regards to the CIA. Uh, But the army or I'm talking about the army, meaning the broadly the the American military forces, I should say. I think the American military forces did take some very clear lessons from uh, Vietnam. The, the case in Vietnam was it was such a quagmire. Oh, let me say that. It's a trite to almost say that, but it was such a quagmire of, of different entities, different militaries, if you will, engaged in such a brutal war so that there were the South Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, off, uh, military was engaged in torture. There was the American military working with the South Vietnamese Army engaged in torture. And then there's the CIA operating its own program, sometimes with the American military and sometimes on its own, working also with South Vietnamese intelligence forces. So there were a lot of different actors there. But I do think that one of the important things that came out of the Vietnam War was that Within the American military, there were some very, very, within the Pentagon, there was the emergence of a robust cadre of human rights, international law, law of war specialists that emerged in the, they really took, uh, became rooted in the, in the Pentagon in the 1970s and 1980s. And I think What's, what is important to remember about them is it's, it's those officers who were trained in human rights and international law and the laws of war who provided some of the most important resistance to the war on terror's excesses in the George Bush administration. 
if it hadn't been pe- for people for constantly throwing sand in the gears in the Pentagon, I think the uh, war on terror would have been far more, the excesses would have been far more pronounced. Interesting. Now, with regards to the CIA, there were, of course, hearings held in 1973 that would extend on into the excesses of the CIA, not just in Vietnam, but elsewhere. And there were efforts to roll back the CIA, of course, and that happened briefly, uh, we'll say in the late 70s and into the 1980s. But under Reagan, the CIA, of course, ramped things back up again and was also working with all sorts of regimes across Latin America and, and, and Southeast Asia uh, during the 1980s uh, and into the 1990s. So that I, I, I would definitely agree with you. I'm not sure the CIA uh, ever learned the lessons uh, one might have hoped they would have learned after the uh, the fiasco in Vietnam. Well, they certainly didn't, I don't think, uh, had too much of a reason to learn it after Iraq either, right? I mean, we now have a uh, director of the CIA who oversaw the torture of yep. at least, um, at le- you, know, you know, I think documented uh, at least one prisoner. Um, we have... Um, uh, I, I just saw the other day that the uh, guy Rodriguez, who was responsible for getting rid of um, the uh, the torture tapes, um, I think that's his name. Was was uh, they made a they named a school after him or something to that effect? I, I, mm. I, I something some to that? he was just literally in the news the other day. It was in passing, um, but he was commemorated oh, in some fashion. Uh, there is, I mean, this is this seems to me to be sort of. Uh, you, the the you, you could have laid out the same theories just by looking on this yes. era, right? Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, just expand on that for a moment. Well, yes, I, I and I think that that was one of the uh, you know I, I worked so to speak backwards from uh, someone would say I was very present in this, about this, but I became interested in this because my very first research as a as a as a historian in graduate school was on the phenomenon of lynching of African Americans in the American South. And so I knew there was a tradition of not only extra legal violence, but also of extra legal torture on a, on a massive scale and one that was tolerated, if not openly saluted, celebrated by many people. So, uh, then when I, when I, was responding like many Americans to the photographs of Abu Ghraib from learning more and more about the enhanced interrogation program. I was, I was asked myself, well, why, why, why is this, how is this rationalized on what basis could, could we adopt these programs? Um, And looking, as you said, what I've been struck by is the repetition of a kind of, argument that, well, we have to adopt these extreme methods because the threat to our way of life is so extreme. In the case on the war on terror, it's because we have these barbaric Islamic terrorists who do not accept the rules of civilization, the rules of war, and they will use any methods to destroy us. So we have to go, as Dick Cheney put it, to the dark side. Uh, that is, in a nutshell, the rationale that has been repeated time and time again for adopting methods that otherwise we allege we would never do. So I think the fundamental point is we always tell ourselves that we only adopt torture in extreme circumstances, whereas other people in the world apparently do torture because it's somehow part of their innate civilization or their innate way of, of government. So ours is always keeping torture at a distance as something that we don't really do unless we're forced to do it, which is, which is a, uh, a very convenient uh, way to constantly restore American innocence, to constantly say that our society is somehow purer than others. I, I should say that I just um, the uh, the Rodriguez thing is in the new spy museum, I guess, and he is um, he is basically put into a two sides of the coin about whether we should be torturing. 
Um, oh, good. And, and yeah, which is but but literally given an opportunity to um, to uh, uh, you know in an interview to say that um, that uh, that torture saved lives. Um, it, well, I suspect though, he, does he actually use the word torture, or does he? Does he no, say of course, enhanced it's interrogation. enhanced interrogation, yes. and right. yes, of course. Well, but so yes, let me ask that's you this. the other thing is euphemism always. We don't torture; we do enhanced interrogation. Whereas those other people, they torture. Wait, is this is this uniquely American? I mean, no. We, Okay, so no. I mean, it's not. Uh, I mean, where where is is there is there an element of this sort of uh, rationale um, uniquely American, or is it simply um, this is how people around the world do bad things? They say when we do it, it's slightly different than bad. Yes, well, I think I think you're right. There there are aspects of this that are definitely uniquely American. What I would say is part of American exceptionalism is the ways there there's a particular stake I think for the American way of life in claiming that we are the last best hope use Lincoln's phrase the last best hope for democracy and that somehow we matter more not just now because we're the most powerful nation on the planet, but even in the 19th century when we were far from the most powerful nation on the planet, there was the idea that somehow American democracy represents what is most modern, most progressive, most civilized civilization. So it, it's important for that ideal of American democracy to be innocent and pure and constantly in a state of achieving its, its perfection. And torture is, unfortunately, for those who would justify it, torture is not, you can't reconcile torture with the idea of a modern, progressive, innocent civilization, democratic civilization. So I think you're absolutely right. That aspect of it is very specific to the United States. But what interests me about, or one thing that interests me about torture and the challenge it poses to democracies is, Torture is, of course, antithetical to democracy because democracy is supposed to rest on the consent of the governed. And it's supposed to re rest on the idea that the fair exchange, the full and fair exchange of truth and of knowledge makes possible a public that will consent in the best possible way to achieve the ends that the society is pursuing. So it will pursue the best for the largest number of people. Well, torture doesn't fit into that model. And so I think for any society, so I'll point to Britain. The British are very, very proud of their tradition of rule of law and respect for law. And in many ways, it, it is enviable. But, of course, the British were quite willing to use torture, whether it was in Kenya or Northern Ireland, and have a very difficult history of torture in the 20th century. That doesn't mean the British have ever said to themselves, you know, I mean, some have, but it's not as though the British were any more willing than Americans to somehow come to grips with the fact that they had a society that harbored torturers and that had produce justifications for torture. So I think any democracy is going to be particularly challenged the way, of course, another model of government can either blame it on those who are in power or else justify it as the means, as a form of, uh, as an outgrowth of that form of government. Okay, so so lastly, let me ask you this. I mean, if it's the case that the, the, the practice of this sort of... Um of the euphemism and the del uh, the sort of delusion uh, is not uniquely American, but the the stakes are because um, our story of ourselves uh, mm -hmm. is so in contradiction to that notion of, of torture. What what are the implications of a going from? Uh, the, the Bush administration where, you know, the, you know, uh, Cheney had that 1% doctrine where it's like, you know, and, and, and sort of the popular culture of like, you know, the 24 uh, scenario, you know, the mm -hmm. stop a nuclear bomb to, 
Uh, and then, in many ways, it seems to me, making it easier for the guy who becomes the president of the United States to say, we shouldn't be ashamed to torture. We should do it. I mean, other people do it. We should we should be we should be rough. Uh, I yeah. mean, literally saying this uh, and yeah. becoming president. What, what are the implications of that? I mean, it, I mean, on some level, it makes me feel like at the very least, at least the delusion and the aspirations provided some type of 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 check. And without that, things could get a lot uglier. Yes, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, I, we have, prior to the election of President Trump, we have never had a president who openly endorsed, specifically endorsed torture. I mean, didn't, didn't make excuses for it, exactly as you had. So even a president like President Theodore Roosevelt, who, like the Bush administration, came up with all manner of euphemisms and justifications for American violence during the conquest of the Philippines at the turn of the 20th century, he never would use the phrase, he was never going to condone torture, because that was, that was a horrible thing in his mind. So yes, you're right, we have pierced some sort of, we, we have entered into a new language when uh, a president will openly embrace torture. And I, I think uh, one of the other point I would make, building on what you said, is that as much as the idea of American purity and innocence can be something that we hide behind, it has always also been a very powerful tool for the opponents of torture. And throughout the history of the United States and even into the colonial era, there have been fierce, fierce opponents of any rationalization for torture. And they have always used that idea that if we are going to achieve the kind of civilization we aspire to build, if we're going to create the kind of democracy we want, we cannot have torture. And that that's a very, very powerful um, concept, of sort of mobilizing the core of the American identity against torture. And we can, I can point out all of the ways in which it has sometimes camouflage torture has been an obstacle to, to dealing with torture in all of its forms. But on the other hand, it is still one of the best tools any opponent of torture has to use to try to sway public opinion. But in the current environment, I mean, to me, it's, it's less that, uh, that we may see torture being used against in the Middle East again. I mean, that might, who knows, that may be going on right now. But what concerns me is we have the combination of the rhetoric about using whatever methods we need and also the demonization of people on our southern border. So I, have, I am concerned that we will see more and more accounts of excessive violence and or torture being directed against people along our southern border. And the justification will be that these are people who pose a threat to our nation. They're, some, they're subhuman, they're gang members, whatever the rationale is, and we will have heard it before. Fitz Brundage, the book is Civilizing Torture, an American Tradition. Thank you so much for your time today. We'll put a link uh, to that book um, on our uh, page at majority.fm. Thank you very much. All right, folks, we got to take a uh, quick break here. Um, head into the uh, fun half. Went a little long there, but um, fascinating stuff. Um <clears throat> Just a reminder, you can support this show by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. And uh, by becoming a member of the show, you support the, the free show. And then uh, we give you extra content every day. We try to. And it's commercial free. So uh, you have all of that as a benefit of being a member. And while uh, just a reminder... Calming Comfort by Sharper Image is the luxurious weighted blanket that's designed with high-density comfort fill to promote a sense of calmness for a restful night's sleep. The Calming Comfort weighted blanket comes with a 90-day anxiety-free, best night's sleep of your life guarantee. 
from Sharper Image. Right now, our listeners go to calmingcomfortblanket.com. Use the promo code MAJOR15 at checkout to receive $15 off the displayed price. Again, that's calmingcomfortblanket.com. Promo code MAJOR15 because you can't put a price on a great night's sleep. Also, don't forget, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. Uh, Michael's not here, but presumably he'll be here tomorrow night for uh, the Michael Brooks show. Yeah, and I think we might be eating the food bucket tomorrow night. Oh, is that right? Wow. Yeah, I'm not sure. He better rest up for that. Yeah. That's Yeah, exactly. He's doing a cleanse right Have you now. heard of, uh, of the term mukbang, Sam? Mukbang? Yeah, I was just introduced to it. It's apparently a South Korean thing started, but it's just people eating on camera. Oh, yeah. Muk is like food and bang is broadcast, apparently. Oh, yeah. So we might mukbang the food. Is that They've like got a, uh, um, videos of that at Mission Chinese Food oh, restaurant yeah. I just went to the other night. Oh, yeah. that's a good restaurant. I've been Super to good. Um, is that like, a, what do you call it, that MRS? What is that? Uh, I think it is similar to ASMR. ASMR. Yeah. It's weird. It's, it's weird stuff. Uh, that's the parallel I'm drawing is they're both weird. Well, competitive eating is a big thing in Japan. Well, I've been there. I've done that. Competitive eating? I've been in like a hot dog hot dog eating contest, sure. Back in the day. Rum chugging. All of it. I've done all of it, folks. Uh, Jamie, what uh, what's happening on the Antifada? I'm so glad you asked. So, if you could not get enough <laughs> of our 90s episode with Katie Halper last week, we have released a bonus for our patrons where we do even more 90s talk with Katie Halper and we sing a song. So... That's fun. Um, we also recorded an episode over the weekend with the Marxist geographer, Sam Stein, that I'm very excited to release this week. Uh, on Literary Hangover, we discussed the Song of Hiawatha by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, a very uh, sort of famous poem that uh, has really gone out of date since then. We talk about maybe why that is. Uh, we talk about uh, Edgar Allan Poe being really racist about Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and his uh, attempts at writing anti-slavery poetry, which on the other hand, like the abolitionists were like slave drivers could read this in the morning and still eat their breakfast fine. So he wasn't exactly a radical. So it's kind of interesting. He's an interesting guy uh, and probably forgotten because he wasn't bold enough uh, artistically in terms of his politics. So there you go. Got to be bold. Uh, speaking of bold, I, w I, w I wasn't, you know, I, I refrained from asking last week, but is it really Hiawatha as opposed to Hiawatha? Uh, that Longfellow himself pronounced it Hiawatha. Yep. Oh, so now he's, uh, despite all that, now you say he is the arbiter. Well, I, the, the thing is, is his creation of Hiawatha, it, I mean, Hiawatha the man was an Algonquin, and Longfellow makes him an o Ojibwe uh, Indian in, uh, in the Song of Hiawatha. So it's, it's very ahistorical, but I make that point. So uh, it could be Hiawatha. It could be. Because I grew up saying Hiawatha. Yeah, I don't want to take that away from you. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, folks, going to head into the uh, fun half, 646-257-3920. We'll take your calls. Uh, don't forget, join the majority report.com. You right. are in for it. All right, folks, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Are you ready? Who sent us this? Anarchy. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back, and the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you can imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back, and the alpha males are back, back, back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it in my throat. Alpha males are back, back. Almost says what? The alpha males of back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males of back, back, back. I, I, I am a total cunt. Can we bring back DJ Danner's song, please? Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break. That's fucking nonsense. Hey, folks! Uh, 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 I do not have Parkinson's.
and the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck em. Uh, <laughs> Almost says what? 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 Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are black, 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 black. African and the alpha males are black. Doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. You can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck em. Fuck em. Fuck em. Fuck em. Fuck em. Fuck em. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! It's my birthday! Okay. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. We are back. It's the fun half. Just reading a um, semi self congratulatory uh, piece in the um, New York Magazine, New Yorker, uh, New York Magazine, yeah, by Jonathan uh, Chait. <laughs> Saying that, uh, basically saying that uh, Joe Biden uh, is proof that the Democratic Party is uh, not as left as we thought. And Jesus I guess, Christ. well, I mean, I guess we're going to find out um, if, you know, the real question is, and the funny thing is, is that, you know, he says the thing that it really teaches you that Twitter is not reflective of that. And that's true. But I think um, what we'll also see when people have time to actually hear Joe Biden speak. And by people, I mean the people that he's claiming are not represented on Twitter. Because just as Twitter is not real life, neither is the New York Times opinions uh, columns or, you know, what is written online. That is also far more narrow uh, than what we're talking about particularly in May yeah. of, uh, of an election cycle. So it's going to be sort of uh, fascinating to see where that leads. But in the meantime, we are seeing more and more candidates uh, be exposed, and it's going to be fascinating to see if this stuff catches up with them. And there are people who are trying to reorient themselves. There are reports out, um, I guess, over the weekend uh, into today that – uh, Beto O'Rourke is going to be relaunching with a Beto 2.0, which is fascinating, which is a fascinating paradox because the thing about Beto that was supposed to be the selling point is he's new, he's fresh, and... He's also born to do it. Born to do it. Born to be in it. And the idea that you have to do a relaunch of that is antithetical to that concept and the idea that you would label it 2.0, going back to a term that was old in 2009. 2003 vintage. Exactly. Um, is sort of hilarious. But this is also interesting to watch. You know, because you have, and I'm looking at these polls, and again, you know, it's super early. That's, that's sort of the point I'm making. Uh, but nevertheless, the... the, the they do capture a, uh, a moment in time. Um, and the polling, um, 
you know, shows that uh, Joe Biden uh, has opened up a, a bit of a lead on uh, uh, quite a lead, I should say, on, on Bernie Sanders. And then um, generally Elizabeth Warren uh, comes in third and then uh, Buttigieg. But then the rest are completely in the dust. I mean, just completely in the dust. Now, this this is a little bit different. Uh, and, and we can get to this in a moment. But I want to just the idea is that, you know, you've got someone like uh, Cory Booker, who is now like, I don't know, is he polling like three or four uh, percent? And so they're trying to now reorient. Booker tries to come out with a, um, a big um, uh, gun control reform um, and it. It doesn't really get the attention. I mean, it got some attention. We mentioned it uh, briefly, and it's um, it's a, it's a great policy proposal. This is sort of hand in hand, I guess, with his criminal um, uh, justice reform. But it's fascinating to it to watch these politicians who don't have a a track record that is as expansive and as as deep and as consistent as some others uh, attempt to position themselves in a way that is both um, unique but also against Trump. But maybe in the case of Booker, it really is like, I'm just going to be against Trump Maybe to the detriment of even Trumpism, which is, let's face it, Republicanism. And here is Cory Booker. And this is reminiscent of Joe Biden trying to answer why we shouldn't have Medicare for all, because somehow that lets employers off the hook, which is just a bizarre formulation. One may work, but it's bizarre. Nevertheless, here's Cory Booker with his bizarre formulation of why, particularly in the wake of of the Supreme Court, basically uh, today saying that um, Apple at least is open to a class action lawsuit because of its control over its uh, app store, uh, that the one of the co-founders of Facebook has come out and basically said, time to break it up. Um, there has been an increasing awareness of what the con economic concentration does uh, to society. And here is Cory Booker seemingly completely uh, unable to address this question in a coherent fashion. Chris Hughes, who helped co-found uh, Facebook, has now come out to say uh, that it should be broken up. He says that it is unprecedented and un-American to have this much power in one company. Where do you stand? on breaking up Facebook. I don't care if it's Facebook, the pharma industry, even the agricultural industry. We've had a problem in America with corporate consolidation that is having really ill effects. It's driving out the independent family farmer. It's driving up our prescription drug costs. And in the realm of technology, we're seeing small, small one or two companies controlling a significant amount of the online advertising. So should they be broken up? Well, I mean, you know, again, well, I, I believe in process. And we should have, if I'm president of the United States, I will have a justice department that uses antitrust legislation to do the proper investigations and to hold uh, industries accountable for corporate Pause consolidation. It. So wait a second. He's just outlined the real problem that we have. And then when he's asked, well, should we address it? He basically says, well, I don't know. As if there isn't been over a hundred years of experience, both in trust busting and in um, breaking up this type of, of consolidation and the contrary, where antitrust has been completely defanged. But the fact is, is that the process exists. It is completely a function of political will. It is completely a function of political will. The reason why the Justice Department has not broken up these companies and has done very little of this stuff since the 80s is because that has been the dominant political will. There has been a change in the perspective of, of what constitutes a monopoly. We have the exact same process, the exact same tools as we had 
30 or 40 years ago or 50 years ago, the only thing that has changed is there has been a change in political will. And when that question is put to Cory Booker, he basically says it shouldn't be about political will. And instead, he tries to make it as if the, the increase in awareness of this problem and the commensurate uh, political will to do something about it is whimsical. Uh, industries accountable for corporate consolidation. I Elizabeth think, Warren's already out there saying break up Facebook, break up uh, Google. But I, 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 I don't think <clears throat> break that, up Amazon. Right, but I don't think that a president uh, should be running around pointing at companies and saying breaking them up without any kind of process here. I, do I think it is a massive problem in America, corporate consolidation? Absolutely. It's about making sure that we have a system that works. It's not me and my own personal opinion about going after folks. That sounds more like a Donald Trump thing to say, like, I'm going to break up you guys. I'm break. No, we need to create systems and processes. You compared to Elizabeth Warren to Donald I, Trump? I, I most that's... certainly did not. Well, she that's is what my she's friend. saying. She's, she's the one that's saying that. Well, again, she has, let her discuss and debate her positions. I'm telling you right now, we do not need a president that is going to use her own personal beliefs and tell you which companies we should break up. We need a president that's going to enforce antitrust laws in this country, and I will be that person. You know, this is really super suspect because um, if you look at the history of people who broke up these companies, they name these companies. The whole point of this and to, to in some way imply when the question was premised on Elizabeth Warren that she's going around because she has a personal beef with Jeff Bezos or she just doesn't like the way that uh, Zuckerberg, you know, dresses or something. Oh, she is very vindictive. I mean, this is this is pretty stunning uh, stuff. And he is there is a process. But the point is, is that there's been no political will. It is really just a question of how does the executive branch want to approach this? And he is hiding the ball here. Here is a, a reminder for you why he might. Um, this is a guy who particularly when it comes to finance had very little problem with finance, but also I think has a, a similar problem. And I think he just has a broad based allergy towards seeing corporate um, corporations as fundamentally problematic that need that that they're the way that they exist in our society is a political choice here he is talking about barack obama when barack obama was going after uh bain capital's vulture capitalism this kind of stuff is nauseating to me on both sides. It's nauseating to the American public. Enough is enough. Stop attacking private equities. It was... <laughs> oh my God. Nauseating. Oh, my God. See, this is how we know that Jonathan Chait's argument is bullshit, right? Because if Americans were really just voting based on ideology and who's the most conservative, Cory Booker would be closer to the top and Warren and Sanders would not be second and third place. Well, I don't know if that's uh, Chait's argument as much, but I think he's I think he's just um, I think he's declaring mission accomplished just a little bit too early. Um, yeah, I mean, screenshot that headline, folks. Yeah, I, I, I mean, because I mean, here's the the. Um, uh, the bottom line is. The only person who I think is clearly defined really in this race at this point is Bernie Sanders. Both to his um, his detriment and to his benefit. Put up that uh, that chart, and you can see here um, this is um, a data progress um, did a poll, which is sort of a fascinating poll. Who would you consider, and who would you not consider voting for? So Joe Biden, twenty percent of the Democratic electorate. And I think this is like the, well, tied for third or fourth largest uh, percent say they would never vote for him. But 49 percent say they would consider voting for him, which is also the highest. And that's a 30, uh, 29 percent uh, swing. Bernie Sanders, 28 percent say they would never vote for him. I think that's the highest. 
36 percent say they would consider voting for him. The person who has sort of the uh, the, you know, the, the, the most room to grow here, it seems like, is Elizabeth Warren. 13 percent would not vote for her. 40 percent would. Now, I don't think any of these numbers really have a huge bearing on the chances of someone winning, because the fact of the matter is, is um, you have so many candidates running that you can have a candidate who 30 percent will say, I will not vote for. And uh, in, in under any circumstances, 36 percent considering to vote for is 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 very high. But I think Bernie Sanders is probably the most defined simply because he ran three years ago, two years ago. And it's quite clear uh, what his platform is. I think, you know, Elizabeth Warren, it's, it's clear to us what her platform is. I don't think that she's seen as much. Joe Biden, I just don't think that people have a real sense of what Joe Biden is running on. I mean, even if it's like the the even just the the more partisan questions of like i'm sorry i think republicans are people forgive me father i have sinned i think a lot of democrats have come around to the um uh, awareness that um republicans are very problematic yeah. and uh when they become more and more aware of joe biden's um uh, uh, positions in the past, I think it's going to become more and more problematic for him. Yeah. We also have to remember that he's lost two Democratic primaries already. And just because he's friends with Obama doesn't mean that he's going to win. Uh, I also want to see the methodology of these of this poll, because a lot of the time, like, remember that one where it came to light that they didn't talk to anyone under 50? Well, that was the all that, where they that's, only only that, use landlines. Like that, those I mean, are ridiculous. Yeah, I, I think. Look, the the that that poll was was uh, uh, corrected. I don't. I I mean, I don't think this is a question of methodology on these polls. I mean, if they, you know, I think it's I think it's simply a question of we're in May, and um, there really hasn't been other than just the brand Joe Biden. Um, any examination of this guy. Now, it's quite possible this same thing could happen like as soon as people see Pete Buttigieg on the uh, stage, they're going to fall in love with him. Uh, but I think that it's, I think it's unlikely that um, Joe Biden's going to be able to retain the sort of the the general well-being with, you know, or, or wealth, um, uh, the general, I guess, um, uh good uh, will of people when he starts to um, explain his positions. I'm worried it's going to end up like Hillary uh, and Bernie in that there's going to be signs that people are responding to reality with him and as a candidate being out of touch with reality, but it's not going to be fast enough to get him out of the primary and he's going to win the primary because he is... He's tied with Ob he's tied to Obama right now, and that's a big well, asset. It's but still very early too. Like I looked at another chart. Obama was way behind Hillary at this point in time during the 2008 cycle. He did not pull ahead until January of 2008. Right. So right, and and I think um, I mean I think the big thing I don't think the the the, the Hillary uh, Bernie thing is is as good of an analogy because frankly in the primary. Um, she was very substantive. And I think to a certain extent, um, she moved quite a bit towards uh, Bernie's position, then tacked back in the in, in the general, or at least in terms of what was what what she was running on. Um, I don't think it was a question as much as people didn't um, people had a misconception of Hillary Clinton. Um I think, you know, certainly there was a, an effect as the more she ran, uh, the, the there was some element of like people had a lionized version of her when she was secretary of state. It's much easier to appreciate someone where they're secretary of state as opposed to sort of like, you know, presenting their ideas about a whole host of things. And so it, it, we'll, we'll see. But um <clears throat> Let's go to uh, the phones for a moment. Calling from a 340 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, it's 
Chanel again from the Virgin Islands. How are you doing today, Sam? Hi, Chanel. What's going on? Yeah, you know, I'm just trying to stay positive. I uh, am hopefully going to be going back to the Virgin Islands at the end of the year and uh, see how see how things are doing. And I, uh, other than that, I've just been uh, watching and uh, supporting you guys, and I encourage others to do so. And uh, um, any particular comment today? I was just so disgusted with Joe Biden. I'm so disgusted with Joe Biden. I mean, I, I as a citizen, as somebody that's raised in the Virgin Islands, I find it very peculiar that Joe Biden and Jeff Epstein are always there. <laughs> are always there and Jeff Epstein has uh, one of our islands that is actually his. It's a 72 acre island. But um, I'm just really hoping that Joe Biden is not the nominee. And well, I, I'm so disappointed in the Democratic Party. It's well, just, I think, look, you know, some I think the idea is just, you know, let people know around you what uh, Joe Biden's plans are. I mean, that's basically yeah. the, the most important thing that folks can do right now. And I don't even think you need to editorialize about it, frankly. Um, I, you know, there's a piece in the New York Times uh, this weekend when Joe Biden voted to let states overturn Roe v. Wade. That was oh, I guess that was written in uh, uh, about a month or two ago uh, in the New York times. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just think that people just need to be more aware of, of where Joe Biden stands, but I, and I think hopefully that will come as we get closer to the actual, um, uh, elections, but appreciate the call, Chanel. Hang in there. Uh, let's go to a 619 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, uh, hi, Sam. This is DJ in San Diego. DJ in San Diego. What's on your mind, DJ? Um, well, I have kind of a two-part question about impeachment, just basically your thoughts on the two ways that I'm worried it could turn out. Um, so in part one, I think there's a pretty good chance House Republicans wouldn't convict. Um, and I know you said impeach. Or not House, impeachment the Senate, Democrats, you mean, the Senate. Or Sorry, yeah, the, the Senate. Um, but they wouldn't convict. And I know you said in, not impeaching makes Democrats look weak, but I was wondering if you had any concerns that a failed impeachment could kind of give them the political victory I think they were after, but didn't really get with the whole Russia misdirect. And then the second part is um, on the chance they do convict and get rid of Trump and Pence takes over, uh, wouldn't that mean that he could be in the running for 2020? And do you think he'd possibly be a more formidable uh, candidate than Trump would? Well, <clears throat> all right, let me take the first question, of, uh, the second question first. They're not going to convict. That's just simply not going to happen. Okay. Um, and um, I don't know that Mike Pence would be more for formidable. I, I'm not convinced of that. Um, but um, I look, you know, to the extent that I've been hesitant about whether Democrats should impeach. Um, it has been a function of worrying that a uh, Trump may get reelected regardless and uh, you might want to retain that um, that arrow in your quiver. But I think we're, we've gone point past the point where um, I think they need, you know, look, people say impeach as if it would just be we take a vote tomorrow. But I think what they need to do is start the process of impeachment and build the case and uh, hold hearings under the auspices of a uh, special committee that is looking at it, because then you have increased subpoena power, um, one that's considered more weighty by the, by the courts. And I think they simply have to do it. Um, you know, you have today, uh, and I appreciate the call. Let me finish answering. Uh, I'll let you go. But uh, the, this weekend, um, Chuck Schumer, who is... The Senate leader of the Democrats has come out with his legislation. Now, just contemplate the world before the 2018 uh, midterms, right, where most political scientists will tell you, like, look, 
Yes, the Democrats ran on health care. But the fact is they've run on health care many times before. Why was it so effective this time? Largely because on the other side of that debate is Donald Trump. So what is Chuck Schumer? Now, I imagine he's come out with other things or, or maybe he hasn't. I don't know. But on Sunday, Chuck Schumer announced that he is launching a bipartisan push to pass legislation that would rein in what he calls, I'm going to go dot, dot, dot here. What do you think it is? The excesses of the Trump administration, the enormous corruption, the, um, the threats to democracy, the, um, the trade war. I mean, what, whatever, whatever you, there's a hundred different things that you could fill in. What is the Senate minority leader, the one who is going to uh, save us from Donald Trump, what is he going to propose that we do in a bipartisan fashion? This will really hem in the Republicans, ladies and gentlemen. I'm on the edge of my seat. Dot, 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 what he calls, quote, Annoying and hair-pulling calls. Yes. Chuck Schumer has said he has signed on as co-sponsor of the telephone robocall abuse criminal enforcement and deterrence, the Trace Act. Oh, finally. I can see that on posters for the next couple of years. Which he said would give federal agencies the tools and authority they need to prosecute and fine robocallers. He will work. With Congress for swift patches, passage of the bill, sponsored by Senator Ed Markey and Senator John Thune. Schumer said Long Island and New York residents received more than 176 robo, million robocalls in April alone, 720 million since January 1. I mean, look, I get the fact that the Democrats are convinced that they, they don't want to be in a position where Donald Trump is saying, you need to elect Republicans because the Democrats aren't getting anything done. And Chuck Schumer's like, we need to be able to say that we've got stuff done. And we can shoot back and say, we have helped in a bipartisan fashion to end robocalls. I mean, is that the theory that we're operating under here? Well... Everyone knows the greatest threat to uh, regular Americans' material needs is uh, getting interrupted when you're trying to have a nice dinner. Look, they're a pain in the ass. There's no doubt about it. But a strategy that is focused on the notion of like getting the nation's business done. We tried the infrastructure bill. We went there and we tried to, you know, make a big deal out of the infrastructure bill. Half our party's calling for the impeachment of the president. But the leadership's going to go, and we're just going to go, just same old, same old, going to work on robocalls. I mean, there is a muddled message here. And, you know, Chuck Schumer is not this guy, Mike, uh, what's his name again? Bodejedge? I can't remember his name. Uh, Bogie Boguslawski. Yeah, Bogie's Boguslawski. I don't know if people remember this guy, but uh, this was, I don't know, 25 years ago. Here is, here is his... Um, Here's his logo. His, his. For CBS 2 News, I'm Mike Bogoslowski, and I'm in your corner. I so mean, Chuck Schumer you. is Hell still yeah. living in this world where he thinks that he is basically, you know, a local state rep trying to help out his constituents. He is the leader of, this, of the Democrats in the Senate. And the Baileys, his imaginary uh, family on Long Island, um, maybe they haven't, you know, maybe he hasn't broken it to him yet. It's just, it's just amazing to me that this is where they are placing their, uh, resources. I mean, great, do this. And maybe it's just a press conference that he's holding, but I mean, honestly, 
It's also a bit of attack on the majority report because we make great content out of those sorts of calls. Those robo calls, yeah. I mean, if we don't get those uh, fake, uh, those fake calls. <laughs> well, it could be good news for any progressive who's running against the establishment Democrats and trying to paint them as out of touch. I, I mean, I don't think anybody's going to make hay off of running against this, uh, uh, that they're doing robo No, it's just more like the fact that he's not doing anything else. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe that's my uh, 2022. Yeah. <laughs> call him from an 847 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Dude, I'm so excited about those robocalls. It's, uh, it's Josh from Chicago. Josh from Chicago. You excited about getting them or having them go away? Go away. Yeah. That's why I'm voting for, for Biden. Biden's going to no. take care of those robocalls. <laughs> yeah, I know. In a bipartisan way. Um, I actually did want to chime in about this whole, uh, the Biden and the, the, this booty judge thing. Um, I relayed an incident that, or anecdote that happened to me a few weeks ago where I was at, um, I was talking with um, uh, my cousin and they basically said that the reason they like Buddha judge is it has nothing to do with policy because they don't care about policy or that policy isn't what's most important to them. They just care about like the vibe he's giving off or it's like a philosophy. Yeah. Um, and I think it's important to realize that a lot of people don't give a shit about policy, which I, is why someone like Warren is not doing well. Well, no, like, wait a I second. Think Bernie gives off. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. Okay. Josh, let me just first off. It is true. Pete Buttigieg, it's like Aaron Sorkin has created this character. Um, exactly. But Elizabeth Warren's not doing badly. She's doing significantly no, she's better. Doing badly. She's doing better than Buttigieg. I mean, she's probably got double the polls numbers that he does. Now, maybe that's just um, name recognition because she's a sitting senator. But she's also doing much better than than Booker and Gillibrand and Kamala Harris. Um, and But I think largely I understand your point i don't know if it's really just a feeling as much as it's this notion of who they think is going to win but i would also suggest that the value of policy is not necessarily in the policy in and of itself it is what is projected subtextually when those two things meet and mm -hmm. um I will reiterate that Hillary Clinton, during the um, the primary, she got into policy. And I think um, I think, you know, we will see when we start to get on those debate stages. What happens and it's going to be a function of how uh, aggressive the questioners are or how aggressive the other candidates are. But what does someone look like when they're talking in generalities? next to someone who is talking in generalities that are tied to specifics. That's going to be the real question. I don't know the answer to that, but that's, I think, is going to be the question. Yeah, I mean, I've seen Buttigieg on the debate stage. If people don't remember, he, was, he ran for DNC chair, and I, he's not that good of a debater, actually. Um, I think, um, for me, yeah, it's going to come down to that, but it's also, like, how well these people can dodge this shit. Like... <laughs> And how disciplined I think Bernie and Warren are going to, and I think they will be, they need to be disciplined in calling these people out on not having policies. Yep. I, I mean, I, I agree with you on that. And I think there's going to be a, um, an increased ability to dodge because you're only going to get, you know, if you got nine people, they're going to do uh, like two debates in a row each time. So every time we say there's a debate in June, there's actually two debates. One's going to be like on a, on, a, on a Monday. The next one's going to be on a Tuesday or something to that effect where um, and it's all going to be uh, random. So it also depends on who's in which heat, as it were, um, and what night they're on and who they're with um, and which one gets more of the viewership. I mean, there's so many things that are up in the air. It's going to be interesting to see this. But I think like, yes. When you're talking in the spring of, of 2015, I mean, not 2015, but that's a, functionally where we were. When you're talking the spring a year out, a year and a half out from the primary, it's understandable for that people are just like, I, I want to take, um, 
I'm more interested in sort of like the, you know, uh, I'm not writing a critical review. I'm just having dinner right now, essentially. And I think that's going to change as people get close or maybe it won't. And then it's going to be really sad. But I appreciate the call, mm-hmm. Josh. Thanks. Yep. Bye. Calling from uh, 619 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? 619. What's that? Uh, okay. Yeah, maybe that was the same caller. I don't know. Sometimes that happens. Here's another 619. Calling from a 619 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello, Sam. This is Ed from San Diego. Ed from San Diego. What's going on in San Diego today? I think it's like the second or third call we've gotten from San Diego. Hey, I'm off today, so I'm just sitting around. All right. But have you heard the latest defense that Dave Rubin is using to dodge debates? Uh, in fact, I have, uh, and I appreciate the uh, the call. Uh, let's look at the tape right now. This um, is uh, a uh, video that was sent to us by listener Evan, and I believe it was listener Evan was was in fact there at a Turning Point USA at Santa Clara University. I think this is over the weekend. Uh, Dave Rubin, classical liberal uh, that he is, was uh, there with Turning Points USA most recently in the news for having another white supremacist uh, problem. Unclear if that was before or after this. I'm not sure. I mean, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, you know, once or twice these type of scandals hit a an organization, you could say, like, oh, there's, you know. The correlation is not causation. Right. But at one point, you start to say, like, I'm starting to see a pattern here. Um, but here is this event where, um, where listener Evan came up and asked a question of Dave Rubin. Hey Dave, um, so I've been watching your program since about like early time in high school, now I'm in college, so it's been a while, but um, one thing that I really liked, uh, something that you talked about here was the difference between uh, diversity of thought and uh, diversity of identity. Sure. Now the thing with a diversity of thought is I feel like that's a problem you actually perpetuate on your show because the only time you really have left-wing guests are when they're members of the intellectual dark web such as Harris or Weinstein and they're only there for the bulk of the time to uh, talk about the regressive left. And so I pretty much wanted to ask you why won't you have Sam or Sam Cedar on? Yeah, uh, he's recording it too. Okay. Yeah, I mean the guy's just he's just a dishonest player who's just lied about me repeatedly like I'm not going to do it. So would you be willing? Excuse me? Dishonest player? I would like Dave Rubin to uh, say in where I've been dishonest. I claim that he was funded by the Koch brothers, not directly. I was very clear about this. Through an organization that came out of George Mason University that sponsored his um, a series of his interviews, and he subsequently conceded that was the case. I now the idea that he would smear me in this way for simply reporting on something that was true ugly is a serious ugly. allegation. And the idea that I have in any way slandered him isn't in and of itself a slander. Now, yes, it is true that at one point, Michael called him stupid, and I reprimanded Michael for that, and I apologized publicly to Dave Rubin for it, yet he still refused to even discuss any policies with me. And frankly, that smells like a dodge. So if not me who is slanderous and a smear merchant and dishonest. What about other people would you have on who have differing opinions for you? And all you do is you set up as you stand in front of a big government sucks uh, poster is malign the so-called left. But yet you won't have any of those people with the leftist ideas on your show. Odd. Well, maybe if you were offered other people, 
just, just lied about me repeatedly, like, I'm not gonna do it. So would you be willing to have Natalie Wynn of ContraPoint or David Pakman or Kyle Kalinske? All of these are progressives who have- I'm not, in principle, I'm not against having any of them, but I'm not gonna have people that attack me personally. I think it's pretty obvious if you watch what I did up here. Like, I don't attack people personally. I'm happy to talk about ideas. You're gonna go after me personally. You're gonna lie about me and slander me and things like that. Like, it's just not the game I'm playing. There's no win in it for me. You know, I have a certain set of rules when it comes to talking to people and Pause how I sort of behave. As I think the um, the fact that he determines who his guests will be on the scale of there being a win in it for me. I think is the uh, one of the more revealing things and the more honest things that Dave Rubin has said. Um, he attempts and look, Dave Rubin is perfectly he, he is beyond well within his rights to not have anybody he doesn't want on his show. The thing I take issue with is the idea that he presents himself as taking on all comers. That his whole um, shtick is to allow for ideas that otherwise wouldn't be available to people to be aired. And that we can take on all ideas. Yet, he is excluding the very ideas that the show is almost built around maligning. Because he's going to go on now to say, like, if you look at my uh, roster of people, they're all liberal or this or that who have left the people I will not have on my show. And so he claims to have this wide array. And so all I take issue with is that claim. Is that claim. I mean, and if you look at the evolution of Dave Rubin, and I like to think that at least part of our pointing out that the idea that he was of the left and he used to support, he used to list a bunch of policies in addition to the fact that he was gay and married, which he probably had to stop at one point because he realized like, wait a second, I'm using my identity as a means in which to um, show my bona fides, which is of course contrary to the idea that he promotes. But, it was only two years ago when Dave Rubin was saying that he was for Medicare for all. He was for a single payer system. And it had to be pointed out to him that when you talk about being for a single payer health care system and smaller government, that you could not articulate two ideas that were more inconsistent with each other. There would be no other version of big government in the way that they're talking about it, because he has no problem with the military, uh, than to say, we're going to have the government provide health insurance for everybody. Because the biggest thing that the government does now is social insurance, social security and health care that does not involve um, the military. And to expand that would be even more of that. But let's hear his uh, justification for this. Talking to people and how I sort of behave as a public person. And if you don't have rules, like, I'm just not that interested. But, but also, I think your premise is actually wrong. If you were to look, and someone did break this down on Facebook, I don't know how many shows I've done, maybe 500 interviews, something like that. Most of my guests actually either were lefties or are lefties to some extent. So it's like, you can say, well, Harris, and Brent Weinstein, who considers himself deeply progressive, who was a professor at Evergreen State, the most lefty college in the United States. You could say, well, he's not a progressive anymore. Well, if he's not a progressive anymore, it's not because he moved, actually. It's because the left went bananas. So telling me, so Eric Weinstein, who voted for Bernie Sanders, you can't tell me he's not a progressive. My guest two weeks ago, Nick Christakis, he is a, he considers himself a liberal. He's an old school liberal. Uh, so I think my, I don't know if there's a show that has a sort of wider net. I've actually never seen it, but I'll, as long as someone's respectful, I'm more than happy to talk to them. I'm sure that Sam Cedar will be more than willing to have a respectful discussion, but my point was not to yeah. discredit the progressiveness of um, either of them. I just wanted to say that I think you should have more people on the left that you would consider to be a part of the regressive left on your show. That's all.
Okay. Ooh, that's going to stink to have that type of applause at your own talking uh, Turning Points USA uh, event. That's sort of surprising. Um, Jesus. And it is true. Be completely um, uh, respectful. And if I wasn't, then I would be the one who validates your entire claim. So this is an opportunity for you, uh, Dave, to further uh, your claim. I mean, you've asked for uh, these people, Rob Reiner, Michael Flint, Chelsea Handler, Sarah Silverman, AOC, Bernie Sanders, Senator Warren, Mark Ruffalo, Stephen King, Judd Apatow, Maddow, Amy Schumer, Lena Dunham, Cory Booker, Seth MacFarlane, you would love to chat with some progressives who can keep it civil. But you notice how he mentions AOC in this? Look at this other tweet that he, and Bernie, knowing he's, knowing he's going to be left in the socialist dust, has to sit there and pretend like she knows what she's talking about. But that's not being very civil about AOC. That's pretty stunning. Ad hominem. That's kind of exactly what he's mad about us for doing now, to him. Now, to be fair, those two um, tweets came almost 10 days apart. <laughs> So it looks like uh, the kettle is uh, calling someone um, iron and black. It, I also like how half of the people he tags are celebrities <laughs> who are not uh, primarily known for political commentary. What we mean half? No, they're all people who espouse uh, liberal perspectives on, uh, but they're all they're all um, almost three quarters of them are actors. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's pretty nuts. That's like, I would like to debate James Woods. I mean, I would. I'd be happy to, but I don't really think that, like, you know. Uh, He's not Edmund in the lineage of Edmund Burke. For yeah, instance. exactly. I mean, the, um, I mean, the fact is, is that there is virtually no one who is interested in uh, having an exchange with me that I wouldn't have an exchange with. Maybe I have it on this show. Maybe I'd go on their show. Um, I'm happy to do that. And I feel like I have a responsibility to do that. You know, sometimes uh, the scheduling issues, but uh, I'm open to it. Adam Kokesh, uh, you know, at one point jumped on, said yes. Uh, well, what's his face? Who's that guy whose show I was on? The the crazy guy? Oh, um Brandon? No. Straka? Oh, Jesse Lee Peterson. Jesse Lee Peterson. Oh, right. Yeah. right. Uh, I went on his show. Brandon Straka uh, wanted to, um, and, you know, I'm I'm happy to go because that is, you know, that's part of, I think, our responsibility. If you want it, you can get it. That's well, right. Whichever uh, Hollywood actor gets to debate Dave Rubin, maybe you can help them prep. Yeah, well, I don't think they're going to. <laughs> But we'll I think uh, I think we should. Some of them should tweet out uh, to tell Dave to debate you. Yeah, listen, and I am not going to tell people to go to Dave Rubin events and ask this question. I haven't told anybody to do that. It's happening organically um, because I think people genuinely have this question of Dave Rubin, and so you know, um, I just want to make that clear too. Oh, and one of the people that he claimed as being on the left, uh, Eric Weinstein, I just looked him up. He's the managing director of Teal Capital. Uh, his brother, oh, yeah, yeah. I think. Oh, different guy? Right. Well, no, sure. they're, no, they're, Brett, they're yeah, brothers. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah he, you're right. he mentions both of them. Right. Um, but it's, it, you know, he. the bottom line is he sits there and nods regardless of who's sitting there. And he uh, does not know what to do when he needs to actually question and interview someone with thoughts that are actually challenging to his. That's safe the issue. Spaces. Speaking of safe spaces, um, the man who, um, whose biographer we had on this program, right? Uh, who did a biography of Mike Pence, mm -hmm. called him the most powerful theocrat in the history of the United States, in terms of uh, political position. Uh, Mike Pence was at Liberty University, basically telling uh, the students there that 
Donald Trump, a deeply religious and moral man, is, um, is protecting them and also prepare to go out and as you go into the profane world where people think that, um, that women should have sovereignty over their own bodies and sovereignty over their own lives, where people think that people's sexual orientation should not make them second-class citizens, where people think that people who feel themselves to uh, want to identify as a different gender are in somehow infringing upon God's will that will implicate them. Be prepared to be shunned and metaphorically burned at the stake, or in other words, to have people disagree with you. But my message to all of you in the class of 2019 is derives of the moment that we're living in today. You know, throughout most of American history, it's been pretty easy to call yourself Christian. It didn't even occur to people that you might be shunned or ridiculed for defending the teachings of the Bible. But things are different now. Some of the loudest voices for tolerance today have little tolerance for traditional Christian beliefs. So as you go about your daily life, just be ready. Because you're going to be asked not just to tolerate things that violate your faith, you're going to be asked to endorse them. You're going to be asked to bow down <laughs> to the idols of the popular culture. Bow down, so you man. need to prepare your minds for action, men and women. You need to show that we can love God and love our neighbor at the same time through words and deeds. Yeah, a lot of people probably wonder, like, what's he talking about? Um, <clears throat> this notion of Christian oppression in this country is uh, stunning. And the idea that if you are licensed by the state to provide medical care, let's say, or prescription drugs, and your ability to do so is a function of licensing by the state, and reliant upon all the laws that are set up by the state to ensure that the medicine you're delivering um, is safe and whatnot. The idea that saying you can't pick and choose who you provide that medical care to based upon who you think are living a sinful life as if that is some form of oppression to Christians. You have a choice. Don't go into that profession. This is, uh, this is the, the, the battle that he is trying to gear them up for. Well, I think he's speaking of the social sphere as well, because it is true that there are certain beliefs that certain strands of Christianity have interpreted to be the Christian beliefs that are no longer acceptable in certain places in polite society like hating people just for being gay or thinking that trans people are an abomination or whatever and that's a good thing well i mean the fact is is that you can there is no there is no law that says that you can't have those feelings if that's what your religion teaches you and even if you want to slice it as like hate the sin and not the sinner but you don't have the right in civil society to impose that morality on the rest of us and the morality of acceptance is not a reality it is simply the the rights that every citizen has to have housing the same access to housing same access to uh, accommodations and food and jobs and whatnot. And, and, and frankly, we don't even have uh, enough protections in that regard. So if you want to live in a gated community, barter your uh, services to your neighbor, that is certainly up to you. 
But if you want to engage in uh, commerce and whatnot in, uh, in civil society, then you have to accept that your morality does not get to dictate who gets rights and who doesn't. Even though, frankly, to a certain extent, we still have that problem. But I don't know. I mean, you could have said those same words uh, when they started to roll back uh, anti-miscegenation laws. Um, meanwhile, Donald Trump launching a uh, trade war with China. China supposedly will hit back uh, June 1st. And um, here is Larry Kudlow on with Chris Wallace on Fox News admitting that Donald Trump does not seem to understand how tariffs and trade wars work. Now, I think there are problems with the way that we have set up some of our businesses, and I think that we should have, uh, in certain instances, protect certain businesses. But um, Donald Trump doesn't seem to quite understand the dynamic that's going on here. And uh, here is Larry Kudlow having to concede the um, one of the fundamental points about Donald Trump's tariffs. It's not China that pays tariffs. It's the American importers, the American companies that pay what in effect is a tax increase and oftentimes passes it on to U.S. consumers. Uh, fair enough. In fact, both sides will pay. Both sides will pay in these things. And of course, it well, depends. Well, if it's a tariff on goods coming into the country, the Chinese aren't paying. Uh, no, but the Chinese will suffer GDP losses and so forth. Um, with respect to a diminishing export market and goods that they may need for their own uh, I understand that, but economy. the president says China doesn't, that China, it pays the tariffs. They may suffer consequences, but it's U.S. businesses and U.S. consumers who pay, correct? Uh, yes, to some extent. I, mean, yeah, I don't disagree with that. Again, both sides, both sides will suffer on this. <laughs> wow. This is like, they're banking on this notion that, um, that support for this policy will come from people who are just excited to see China suffer. And really, like, you know, whose interests are ultimately being protected anyways, right? Like Hollywood's ability to get DVDs that are not, um, that are not being uh, ripped off. I mean, this is um, sort of stunning. But the once a Trump peace... To, now, I will say this too about Larry Kudlow. For the better part of 30 years, maybe more, actually, 35 years, Larry Kudlow has been on TV in one form or another talking about free trade, no tariffs. It is fascinating to see someone reject their entire life's narrative for a gig in their uh, twilight years. I mean, he must have been super bored. It really is stunning to see uh, Larry Kudlow um, sell himself out that way. The other thing that's stunning, on one hand, you have folks like Larry Kudlow who have ejected all of their, even their, like I never, you know, Larry Kudlow's answer for everything was to cut taxes to have no tariffs and whatnot. He sold all that away in about 10 minutes. He's the past, though. What's also equally as disturbing is to look at the future. And Tom Cotton, Harvard-educated, um, Rhodes Scholar, Tom Cotton, who very well could be someone who runs as uh, for the presidency as a Republican in the future, absorbing all the lessons of Trumpism, but without the lack of brain power. Um, this is the way that the media, and this is what I think is really sort of unbelievable about this. To allow Tom Cotton to get away with saying this without sort of pointing out to the American public 
how ridiculous this is. The reason why we have a media and tune into a media is for some measure of skepticism. We don't necessarily have interviewers on the corporate media who are going to question from a perspective. We've, the BBC has provided us some examples of what questioners do um, when they're getting aggressive with politicians. But they need to be, they need to have some measure of like, of signaling to the audience like, look, I'm an expert at this, or at least theoretically I'm an expert, and this answer is absurd. Listen to Tom Cotton justify, regardless of what you think about the policy. It'd be one thing if he had some type of coherent response, but listen to how he justifies the fact that farmers in the Midwest are going to probably need a third bailout. He plays the hits. Like where, in, well, we'll, we'll go with this. I want to ask you about the trade uh, sure. negotiations that are going on right now. There was a, just recently a University of Arkansas study from your home state that said retaliatory tariffs by China could end up hurting many farmers in your state. Is President Trump hurting the Americans that he promised to help? So these tariffs are going to end up hurting both Chinese and some Americans. I'll grant you that. Uh, I think they'll ultimately hurt the Chinese more than they will Americans, in part because Chinese companies and their government have been cheating the United States for so long. There will be some sacrifice on the part of Americans, I grant you that. But I also would say that that sacrifice is pretty minimal compared to the sacrifices that our soldiers make overseas, that our fallen heroes who are laid to rest in Arlington make, that are right about well, sacred duty. You can't compare those two sacrifices. That's but, right. And then when, yeah. I, when I'm home in Arkansas, I hear from farmers who are worried about opening up new markets and getting their products to market. But they also understand that China is a serious competitor of the United States and wants to displace us around the world. And they look at the sacrifices that, that soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines make around the world, and they're willing to bear some of those sacrifices in the short term to hopefully in the long term ensure our long-term prosperity and security. Why not pause it, pause it, pause it. What? <laughs> nobody, nobody on that panel is going to go, what are you talking about? We're not at a war with China. We don't have military personnel fighting against china what is like what like what is he is he arguing that the this trade war is going to help our national security when it comes to um things like um like grains and whatnot yeah i keep waiting for him to make some argument about like soft power versus hard power and how the trade war will save us from a real war with china but that would be like way too coherent for this guy well, I don't, I mean, I don't even know if that's, I mean, I think he's just simply saying like, this is the way that we project power. And so we do it on the back of our uh, farmers. Uh, you know, when we do it on the, the back of our uh, military personnel, they m make more of a sacrifice. I mean, it seems yeah. rather bizarre. I was talking to my mother actually, who descends from farmers in North Dakota. And uh, I can say that I don't think it's going to be much of uh, mean much to them that they're troops now, apparently for Tom Cotton's uh, trade war or it's Trump's trade war. Uh, and I think they'd much rather sell like the sorghum in their silo. And, and I, would, I would also remind Tom Cotton that we have an all-volunteer uh, military. Mm -hmm. And I don't think these farmers yeah. signed up Drafted. for this. Yeah. But I mean, he, if, if Tom Cotton wants to go out there and tell everybody that these farmers are happy, but I want to see uh, the version of what we saw in the, um, uh, that gave rise to the um, Tea Party where we have somebody on the floor of the commodities stock exchange talk about, I'm tired of bailing out these farmers. Why are we bailing out these farmers? They made the choice of going in and growing this stuff. They made the mistake of, of doing that and relying on, on our government not to do uh, tariffs and trade. Of course, we won't... Um, we won't hear that, but uh, let's hear. This is the, the tough questioning that we're going to get out of, uh, out of CBS, though. Sure, our long-term prosperity and security. Why not tell them that on the front end? Why not tell them this sacrifice and the higher prices you'll receive, you're going to have to pay, are a part of this conflict, as opposed to saying what's not true, which is that China's going to pay these tariffs to the Treasury? Well, China will ultimately be paying a price for these because... Americans may be shifting their consumption or their investment decisions away from Chinese products that have oftentimes been dumped in the United States. You know, we have Arkansans who are benefiting 
from these tariffs as well. You know, we, in eastern Arkansas, we have one of the largest steel production areas now in the country. They obviously are doing very well. Again, I, I'm not going to say that no one is going to make a sacrifice, but in the long term, the effort is to make sure that the United States remains preeminent as a global superpower, both in the economic and the security. But it, yeah. How, like, I'm honestly not sure, like, how is that going to work? Like, can you win a trade war? Um, uh, my guess is they're going to go back and there's just going to be some cosmetic things. And then um, and then Trump is going to claim that he won. Yeah. I mean, Trump is on the record saying trade wars are good and easy to win. Super so. easy to win. I'm not even sure what that looks like. I mean, it's one thing to support uh, industries in this country that you feel we need to have to maintain a, a secure supply chain. Right. Like, I don't know. Um sensitive um chip making let's say for computers you might want to support a um there may be national security interests and economic security interests in supporting actively supporting industries in this country so that you can secure a supply chain but this is a real bank shot that i think very few people actually think is going to amount to anything um so there you go. Let's uh, I, I want to just as an example, we saw last week and I'm sorry that I, I missed uh, talking about it. But uh, Michael, my understanding uh, did um, Ben Shapiro's disastrous run in on the BBC where he revealed that his debate strategy is to accuse <laughs> the questioner of uh, left wing bias. Um, and I'm but this is a clip of Nigel Farage and Andrew Marr uh, on the BBC. And what's fascinating about this to me is that Farage uses the same exact yeah, tactic exactly. as Ben Shapiro does. Yeah. And I don't know um, Andrew Marr. I don't know what his politics are. But it looks even more ridiculous in the wake of Ben Shapiro telling essentially a Tory that he's super liberal and that's why he's asking these questions. Um, but here is uh, Nigel Farage does not want, and he is now um, the head of the Brexit party does not want apparently the BBC audience to know what his positions are on a whole host of topics still believe that global uh, worrying about global warming is the stupidest thing in human history. I believe that if we decide in this country to tax ourselves to the hilt, to put hundreds of thousands of people out of work in manufacturing industries, given that we produce less than 2% of global CO2, that isn't terribly intelligent. But as I say, here we are with one of the biggest changes in politics that's ever occurred, okay. and you're not even interested. Do you still What's want, wrong with the BBC? Do you still want to what roll, is wrong with the BBC? Do you still want to roll back gun controls and reintroduce handguns well, to this country? This sums it up. Do you know, I've been going around the country speaking at pack rallies every night, and do you know who's not there? The BBC. And from this line of questioning now, I can see why. Do you still you're, not, you're just not interested, are you? Do you still feel uncomfortable you are with foreign languages being interested, spoken on trends? Let's talk about democracy. Let's talk about trust. Let's talk about competence in politics. This is ludicrous. Do you still feel that people with <laughs> HIV shouldn't be allowed into this country? Do I think the National Health Service is there for British people? Yes, I absolutely do. So you, st wow. you still do? Um, do you this is absolutely ludicrous. I've never in my life seen a more ridiculous interview than this. You are not prepared to talk about what is going on in this country today. You're in denial. The BBC's in denial. The Tory and Labour parties are in denial. I think you're all in for a bigger surprise on we, Thursday we have than you can it. even imagine. We have talked about it. Do you still admire Vladimir Putin? No. I've never admired Vladimir Putin. You, well, you asked, I said I wouldn't like you to You asked which country, current this is world leader you most admired. You told GQ magazine... As an operator, but not as a human being, yes. I would say well, Putin. The way he so played the whole so Syria thing. Not as a human being. So I don't, like him as a, I don't like him as a human being. What is your question? What is the relevance of this? What I'm, is the relevance I'm, I'm, of trying, to, I'm trying no, to work no, no, out I'm, who I'm, you are well, and where the well, Brexit I, Party, which wants to I, destroy the party system, asked, is you going. You haven't asked about a single other member of the Brexit Party. You haven't commented on the fact we've got the most diverse list of candidates of any party fighting in this election. From the Revolutionary Communist Party right through well, to well, the no, right. Well, that's worth discussing, isn't it? How have we managed to get left and right together? These things are really interesting to your viewers, not trawling back through a series of quotes from years ago. 
not asking me what my positions are. You know what I, I think is a, is a mistake is to say that the way that I admire Vladimir Putin, or frankly, any uh, sort of quasi-authoritarian or authoritarian leader, is to say, I don't admire them as a person. I just admire the way they operate. <laughs> I think you're much better off going like, you know, in, in person, uh, Putin, very charming fellow. I don't like him as a hockey player. I don't, I, you know, I think he's a nice guy, very great with his pets and his kids and his wife and whatnot. Uh, but the whole operating thing, like where he's, you know, imprisoning people or uh, oh. killing people or... Gotta be tough. That, Gotta be tough. That gambit of like, is it true you believe this? Well, I believe a different thing. Like that is very, when you see it in a row like that, it becomes very obvious. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm here to talk about democracy. <laughs> but also, yes, I just love the way an autocratic leader were, operates. But he's not, I don't think he's a nice fellow. That, uh, we mentioned this on the Ben Shapiro uh, takedown on Friday, but that's the Mott and Bailey fallacy. Have you heard of this one? No. Where the uh, Bailey is sort of like the little pasture area, and you can go out and play in the Bailey with your more sort of out there statements. Uh, and then when actual people who might call you on your BS come around, you retreat to the mott, which is the common sense things like, I believe the NHS should be for British citizens and that sort of thing. You retreat to the common, the, the things that apparently, uh, everybody agrees with commonsensically. Yeah. You know, I've had a recent experience with that. Um, <clears throat> actually just on Twitter the other day, uh, involving oh, yeah? a, uh, yeah, our, our good friend, uh, Michael Tracy, had retweeted, uh, let's talk about this, actually. He's I, still at I was, it. I wasn't going to, but um, I think it's uh, well worth it. Um, so pull this up uh, if you can. Let's, y yeah, yeah. And, and, and go back to uh, Tracy's original. Go, go back a little further here. And then go, go here with uh, Glenn Greenwald. Yeah. So... Um, I, I hadn't noticed this. Uh, Glenn Greenwald, apparently uh, Tulsi Gabbard uh, made some claim about the risk of nuclear catastrophe is higher than ever due to greater hostilities between U.S. and Russia. And I think she was talking specifically uh, in terms of the uh, Mueller investigation. And Glenn, again, returned to, as he did in our conversation what the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists said when setting its doomsday clock to two minutes before midnight. Now, click on the clip there. He clips something that says, uh, the Science and Security Board hopes this researching of the clock will be interpreted exactly as it's meant and an urgent warning of global danger. The time for world leaders to address looming nuclear danger and continuing march of climate change is long past. It's time for the citizens of the world to demand su uh, such action is now. And then it, Goes to another paragraph. Now, let me ask you this. Um, give me your sense. How would you characterize these two? Where do you think these two uh, paragraphs? This is the second paragraph. Nuclear risk has been compounded by U.S.-Russia relations that now feature more conflict than cooperation. Coordination on nuclear risk reduction is all but dead. Those two paragraphs. Take a guess. The distance between those paragraphs. In the atomic, uh, the doomsday clock pronouncement. The distance in paragraphs? Yeah. Uh, I'll say uh, eight. Try double. 16. 15. What? 15 paragraphs away. There was talk about North Korea. There was talk about all sorts of the INF treaty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There was climate change. And then you get down to paragraph 15, which is not to say that that's not relevant. It's relevant. But to say that U.S. relations, then you also have to operate now, that the U.S. relations have been implicated by what Rachel Maddow has been doing, as, but only the parts that suggest that Donald Trump had, was in collusion with Russia, not the parts about Russia actually doing stuff that they did, which is clear that they did. So we're talking about an incredibly thin slice here. And... I think this is incredibly disingenuous. But then, uh, you know, Michael Tracy, I would have not even noticed it or even talked about did, it. Did the report not mention Rachel Maddow? The report did not mention Rachel Maddow. Um, 
And then Michael Trey said, when I brought up this point to Sam Cedar, he laughed off as a ridiculous scared mongering and demanded that I bow before the altar of Russiagate. I need to pull that as a clip. Not busy myself with, yes, <laughs> with uh, petty little concerns about nuclear catastrophe. <laughs> like, I don't know how much Michael Tracy has been tweeting about North Korea. But if the concern is narrowly tailored to the doomsday clock and what it says about how close we are to doomsday as a function of why we're closer to doomsday, the climate, climate change and what Donald Trump has done is climate change should be why you're tweeting constantly. Yeah. Or then the number two answer would be North Korea. And then the number three answer would be pulling out of the INF treaty, which is unclear by policy experts as to who that actually benefits. And then you should also be talking about how the Democrats, weirdly enough, were adamant that he'd not do that. So the, 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 the complaints here are completely incoherent. But that, that argument is, is gone. But the, the bot and Bailey, uh, what did you call it? Mott and Bailey. Mott and Bailey. That's what it reminds me of. Like there's, you know, to his credit, uh, Tracy is um, all Mott and no Bailey, right? Or is that vice versa? Which is the one where you're out in the field? Oh, Bailey is the field. Yeah, yeah it's all Bailey. Field. Yeah, he, needs to, he doesn't retreat to the Mott as well as some other people. That's right. That's right. All right. Lastly, um, Chelsea Manning was on uh, Brian Statler's uh, program this weekend. She has uh, subjected herself to um, real deprivation as a function of of protecting um, WikiLeaks and Julian Assange and. I do think that there is a fundamental difference between um, what we, uh, you know, WikiLeaks of the era when they released the material that Chelsea Manning had acquired, 2010, 2011, I guess, um, and what WikiLeaks has become in many respects. They've become far uh, too involved in pursuing a specific agenda um too much yeah. into donald trump's dms oh yeah. you mean there's difference between uh civilians being gunned down in iraq and like uh what hillary clinton had for lunch yesterday exactly and um and look you know like i think that even even in the context of of putting out that uh the those documents i think um it was really more the mechanism in the way that they did it rather than frankly them doing it. I mean, I understand they're a, um, they're a, an, an information, uh, you know, liberating agency. And I think you are, uh, I, I mean, I think there's some question about that, but I have very little doubt that the, uh, the cables that they released and the video that they released, um, wasn't worthy of, of news reports. And, and I, frankly, you can look at the era from 2011 to 2016, and how many uh, news reports were based on that information. But um, here is um, Chelsea Manning uh, saying that the executive branch, especially Trump, wants to attack journalists and will use the judiciary as a rubber stamp. She is out of prison because the grand jury ended that was looking into um, uh, Julian Assange. There will be another one that will be started, though. They run out their term and then they bring in another one. And she very well may uh, end up back in prison uh, for the duration of that term of that grand jury. God. Do you view the prosecution of Assange as a threat to press freedom? I mean, I think that I think that the Eastern District of Virginia is now turning into a rubber stamp for all these different prosecutions that really are going after. You know, and, and I think that ultimately what they really want is they want to go after journalists. 
Like, the, the, like the, this administration clearly wants to go after journalists. I think that if the administration gets its way, as it's laid out, you know, in repeated statements, like the, the media is the enemy of the people kind of thing, you know, uh, you know, the, then I think that we're going to see that, you know, national security journalists and, and you know, a lot of pre, a lot, a lot of disruptive, you know, for this administration press, we're probably going to see, you know, indictments and charges, you know, perhaps uh, indirectly related. And the average mm-hmm. American commits a, a you know, there's so many uh, federal offenses. The average American commits three felonies a day. So whenever a journalist m- makes a misstep, I think that they're put on notice now that the FBI and the Department of Justice are going to go after them on the administration's behalf. And I don't know what those uh, three felonies a day, but they could be, you know, ranging from like, you know, taking tags off of a uh, mattress. But <clears throat> in terms of service sorts of things. Maybe, yes, I don't know. it's quite possible. Um, Here is where she explains why she uh, may return to jail after May 16th. And what about you? You're due back on Thursday. Yes. Another subpoena for another grand jury. Yes. What's going to happen? Well, it's they're asking this. They they want they've already stipulated they, they want to ask the same questions. So this is not about this is not about anything new. They're not even asking anything. They're not even asking anything new. I've already laid all of this out. So you're going to refuse again. I am going to refuse. I I don't, I think that this grand jury is an improper, I mean, I think that all grand juries are improper. I don't like the secrecy Mm -hmm. of it. One of the reasons why the, why we had so much, why there was so much secrecy and speculation and like so much like hand wringing over the Mueller report was because of the secrecy. secrecy. We would know, we would know far more if we would just have public hearings, bring the stuff out there and like, you know, and I did, I testified, Mm -hmm. you know, before an open court with all these journalists there. Like I have nothing new to provide. But they want to hear from you again. And that's the law. Will you be back in jail next weekend? Well, I'd be, uh, I mean, it, it's going to depend on uh, our, we, we certainly have a motion to quash. We're certainly going to raise every single legal challenge. We have, we have very, you know, we, we have a very strong case. And we had a strong case previously, but now we have additional evidence as okay. to like what, what our case is. So, so it's so, up in the air. We don't know if you'll be sentenced to jail or not. Again. Uh, we don't. <laughs> but, you know, I think that we have a much stronger case in terms of like the legal objections, which, we, you know, the, the mm. previous judge didn't e- refuse to even hear. They, he, they, he refused to even hear the, or, or act on the motions. He just simply placed me in contempt and ignored our, our motions. There you go. God, you know, I don't think anyone would blame Chelsea Manning at this point if she were to seek asylum in another country at least until Trump isn't president anymore or she has some kind of offer to come back. Like, she suffered so much already. It's unbelievable to me. Um, uh, but uh, very brave. Very brave woman. All right, well, we have to... Um, uh, I'm sorry, folks. We don't have time for any more calls. We never got to some IMs. Tomorrow we're doing... Uh, we'll have uh, a little more time. No guests tomorrow. Um, so... Callers, I apologize. Folks, we gotta run. See you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm gonna get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the light bar. Yeah, I know the clock is ticking, but the meds are gonna kick in, and my pilot light shining bright. I guess I'm where the choice was made, for the option where you don't get paid, for the road that bends before it finally breaks. I guess I lost my drive